Hello, and welcome back to the Intuition Revolution. I'm your host, Kim Chesney, and today's guest, Dennis Palumbo, is a novelist, screenwriter, and psychotherapist in Los Angeles. He is the author of the acclaimed Daniel Rinaldi series of mystery thrillers, and you have probably seen his screenwriting genius at work if you've ever watched Welcome Back, Cotter, or the classic film My Favorite Year, starring Peter O'Toole. I met Dennis a few years back at the Sherman Oaks Galleria on that sunny day, and I knew immediately that he was someone that I wanted to talk intuition with. He has such an amazing story. Talk about following your dreams from a small town Pittsburgh boy to making it in Hollywood. That takes a lot of following your intuition, uh, taking risks and, and reaping the rewards. That's really what we're going to talk about today. And and learning about his journey. I am psyched to have Dennis here today to talk about his story and to share all of his secrets of success. So welcome, Dennis. Thank you so much, Kim. It's great to be here. Uh, it's, so, it's so great to talk with you again. Uh, what I love about you is that your work touches so many applications of intuition. You know, it's, it, whether you're talking about screenwriting or psychotherapy or, or even like channeling your inner muse, there's just so many ways that your life embodies like intuitive success. So I'm really excited to, to learn really about, you know, your take on intuition. And have you known your whole life that you were an intuitive person or did you really have to learn to trust that as time went on? How did that unfold for you? Well, I think I had to learn how to trust it. And, and I think the way I learned to trust it is I began writing at a very young age. I mean, I was writing and drawing, you know, comic books and stories when I was like 12 or 13. And I just would follow my nose. I would just go, well, maybe it'd be cool if. And that has been the way I've been working, you know, for the past 55 years is just what if. And the thing that's interesting about being both a therapist and a writer is both jobs require you to totally listen to your intuition, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. totally trust your instincts. You know, you go through so many years of training to be a clinician. And yet when you're re if you're really good and I've been, you know, in private practice for about 30 years, mm -hmm. you sort of throw away all the book learning mm -hmm. and trust your intuition about a patient. I mean, the book learning, forms a foundation. Yes. And the same is true of writing. You can read a lot of books about how to build characters, how to plot stories, how to write screenplays, or how to write novels. But ultimately, you know, it, it, Pablo Casals once said, learn the notes and forget about them. Mm -hmm. I think that's the key. You need a good foundation of the the sort of nuts and bolts of how to do something and then you have to hold all that very lightly in your hand because you are the creator of the thing you're going to do absolutely I, i've had so many patients i had a patient one time uh because most of my patients are creative people writers and directors and actors and i had a, a patient one time who said who had won an oscar and he said, but I'm no Billy Wilder. And he was making reference to a famous film director. And I said, that job's been taken. Of course, you're not Billy Wilder. That job's been taken. You're just you. I love and that. The more people understand that they themselves are the source of all the creativity they're going to do. The way I always put it is really simple. You are enough. You are enough to be the person you want to be, to be the creative person you want to be, and to be the professional that you want to be. You are enough. You don't have to have an uncle in the business. Yep. You don't have to have 75 advanced degrees. Yep. You are enough right now to start being the creative person you want to be. Amen to that. Yeah, and you know what? There, there. I could not have said any of that better. I, I, there's just so many things as you're saying that I'm like, ah, oh, like this and that. It's like, <laughs> it is so, so true, so true that uh, first of all, that you know, really, our, our mind, our intellect, really creates a foundation, right? It creates the framework that our intuition can really use to get us to that level of genius, right? So that's really the difference between, you know, following other people and doing what other people are doing and trying to emulate other people and following our own path. And yeah, I right. agree. 
I agree. Actually, uh, the to me, the, the simple formula is keep giving them you until you is what they want. Mm. And owning that, right? Know. Just owning All who you that. are. You have to take ownership of that. I mean, the moment you start following trends or the moment you yep. try to do something like someone else has done, first of all, they've already done that. And secondly, you are giving away the one spectacular value you have, which is yourself. Yep. Everything that is powerful, interesting, relatable to others, that has an impact on people, comes from the fact that you have mined your own resources, what's in your mind and heart, and then the hard part, trusting it. Oh, yeah. you know, Isn't it's sort that of that true? thing that uh, Ray Bradbury said. He said, writing is like you throw yourself off a cliff and grow wings on the way down. And so that's kind of what intuition is to me. You kind of throw yourself off the cliff and see where it takes you. That is absolutely 100% true. And I always talk about, and in the book, Radical Intuition, I talk about how there's, it's like, it's a really a two part process. It's a complementary process working with your intuition. It's not just having that intuitive insight, it's living it, it's putting it out there, following it through, and taking the risks and acting on it. So it, it's really sort of, you know, you have this input and you have this output. And if you only do half of it, you're, you're really not stepping into that extraordinary place. And that, like you said earlier, that, that, that part of you that's just you that you have to give to the world, that, that's, like, that's that pathway to that genius inside you. That's where the magic is, that only you have access from the inside. You can't get there by following other people or by following rules or by getting degrees or having you know, important family members. That is something that only comes from within. And this is such great advice that you're giving to people to really own that and, and look inside because I really am so passionate about intuition. You know, I like to talk about it all the time, but for me, it's because, you know, I say it's really the most important thing in the world. And from the things you're saying, you can understand why I'm saying this, right? Cause it's that connection to your real self and that extraordinary part of yourself. Well, the thing that's hard for many people uh, is trusting your inter intuition means you have to trust yourself. And trusting yourself is one of the issues people work on in therapy. Mm -hmm. You say to yourself, my feelings are legitimate. Um, my ideas are fruitful and powerful because they're mine, even if no one else sees what I see. So there's a, a really weird line you have to draw between, you know, hubris, mm -hmm. and believing in your own intuition. And there's something slightly hubristic about believing in your own tuition, but I've never known a successful achieving person who didn't have enough hubris to believe that what they're thinking and feeling has value. Right. And I think that's the hard part. Mm -hmm. And it's very different from a kind of uh, willful narcissism mm -hmm. where you think everything you think and say is gold. That's yes. True. Because if you listen to your intuition, you go, well, actually, that wasn't gold. <laughs> right, exactly. The part that people forget about intuition is that it's also, it, you're able to discern as a result of using intuition. Yes. That's a word we use a lot in radical intuition is discernment. Yeah, because it really is important. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, you'll think everything you do is great. Every idea you've ever had is great. And see, the way I look at it, every idea you have is worthy of consideration because it's yours, but you want to have good discernment so that you can say, is this legitimate? Is exactly. this really what I'm trying to say? Is it motivated by fear? Is it motivated by financial need? Am I trying to please my father? Mm -hmm. As you can imagine in my therapy practice, a lot of people's natural intuition and natural creative impulse is often diluted or misdirected because they're trying to please a parent mm. or they're trying to disconfirm something that was said about them or they're in competition with a sibling in terms of how successful they are. Those kinds of neurotic concerns, which are very understandable, they're, they're, they're birthed in childhood dynamics. Those kinds of concerns really dilute your ability to contact your own intuition and follow your own instincts. Well, speaking of that, is there are there any times in your life where not listening to your intuition 
got you in trouble or have you ever been in any of those situations where you were just like, oh, I should have listened to my intuition? How much time do we have? <laughs> yeah, right. I know. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> as lucky as I've been by listening to my intuition, I've made huge mistakes <laughs> not listening to it. Uh, you know, we look at our relationship history, our career history, um, choices we made about where we're living and what we're doing. Most of us, when we look back on things that felt like mistakes, our intuition had given us some red warning lights. Uh -huh. and we ignored them because someone convinced us to, or we ignored them because it seemed to be what everybody wanted us to be. I mean, yep. Oh, because I started college at the University of Pittsburgh as an engineering student. With Jim DeNova. Yes. <laughs> Every instinct told me I did not want to be an engineer. Yep. But I was the first one, I'm the oldest of nine grandchildren, and I was the first grandchild to go to college. And in my family, college meant doctor, lawyer, engineer. And since I'm an Italian Catholic, priest was the <laughs> number one <laughs> yeah but that was not going to happen for a number of reasons I, I i think being agnostic kind of plays against that and yeah. that whole celibacy <laughs> thing doesn't work for me but but yeah so it's doctor lawyer engineer so i was in engineering school with jim denova and we would both skip classes and sit around and drink coffee and say, you want to be an engineer he said no i said neither do i and yeah. neither of you ended up being engineers <laughs> and neither of us ended up being engineers and so when I finally listened to my uh, intuition, it was difficult. I think we have to be honest because my whole family was upset and everybody said, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to be a writer. I didn't know any writers mm -hmm. and my family was a writer. And all I knew is that writers were starving and living in garrets somewhere. You know? <laughs> yep. So following your intuition takes personal courage. Mm -hmm. So true. Yeah, it really is. And, and it's important to remember that you only have one life. You have one precious life. And so if someone says, well, it's risky to follow your intuition, I would argue it's riskier not to. You're risking your one precious life, living someone else's idea of how you should live. That's 10 times riskier than coming to California to be a screenwriter. <laughs> I did. Or going to some island somewhere and painting. Yep. It's your life. Yep. You have to take ownership of your life. And if you don't do that, you'll never be able to listen to your intuition. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. Honestly. Um really that that's that that sums it all up, Dennis. And I honestly I'm I'm gonna come to you for therapy. This is this is it, man. <laughs> you've you've got the and that's where the magic happens, right? That's at your office there. This is where all yeah. the writing and everything happens. It's so cool. Well, to get a... Yeah, I'm, I'm really pleased that we're getting an opportunity to talk. I mean, your work is so important. I'm always so impressed by the stuff I see. Oh, uh, thank you. And everything that you're doing. You seem busy. There's a phrase in Pittsburgh, you're busier than a one-armed paper hanger, <laughs> my mother used to say. And you <laughs> seem that way to me. Well, it's, it's I'm on fire with this, you know, when you well, get, like, yeah. I'm on fire with it. I'm so passionate about it. So I just, you know, I just can't stop until, until I, uh, until that intuition gets expressed, right? It's that second part Absolutely. of the process. Like, it's just telling me I got to go do this and, and hard work. That's part of the process too, right? Yeah. Well, actually, you know, hard work makes you happy. Yeah. You're doing uh, something you love. You of hard work. Everyone goes, gee, I wish I won the lottery. So then I'd sit around on a hammock and eat bonbons. Right. And nothing would make a person feel worse than to do that. That's true. Right? That's because true. In my practice, I have some trust fund kids, you know, mm -hmm. children who were raised knowing that when they turned 21, they were going to have $100 million. Mm -hmm. If they don't find something to do, they're miserable. Right because you have to have something that speaks to who you are and to be able to find what's in your mind and heart and put it out in the world. Right. And that's where that intuitive connection is so important because each of us have that sort of 
purpose in life. There's like something our intuition is calling, like you're calling. You hear people talk about that. Mm -hmm. If we don't listen to our calling, and, and it's unique in everybody. Everybody has their own thing. But if you don't listen to that, whatever it is, that like a part of you dies inside or it sits in there and just atrophies and, and it's just getting it out and expressing it in the world. That's, that's like what, what fills us up inside and makes us come alive. Well, so, that's what Joseph Com Campbell talks about when he talks about the calling, mm -hmm. but he has the call. Yes. You know, the hero's journey, yes. and this is everyone, the hero's journey is about answering the call. Amen. That is so true. And then bringing back to your culture, your society, your world, bringing back what you've gleaned from answering your own call. And that to me is fundamental to living a meaningful life. Absolutely. So on that note, is there a time where, um, like, is there a story you could share with us or a time for when you really answered that call, when intuition was calling you and to go do something you did it and it might have been risky oh, I, or crazy but it turned out great oh yeah. yeah i have i have uh my classic story uh, that i tell people i had been a screenwriter and a tv writer for about 17 years and had been very lucky i mean i worked on a lot of shows uh i had a movie that was critically acclaimed and actually worked on a couple other ones including k9 with jim belushi and a few other movies and I was very doing very, very well, but I had worked on a uh, movie about mountain climbing that had taken me all over the world, particularly in Nepal. And I did a lot of meditating when I was there. And when I came back, I started therapy myself as a, as a patient in therapy because I was needing it very much. And my first marriage had ended and I thought I didn't know what the hell was going on with me. And so I started, I was so fascinated by the process, I started taking classes toward a graduate degree. And I kept telling myself, well, it's not like I want to be a therapist, but I guess it wouldn't hurt a writer to know a lot about psychology. Right. So year after year, I'm taking all these classes, I get my degree, I start volunteering at psych hospitals and low fee family clinics. I'm writing the whole time. I'm still writing movies and TV pilots and stuff. And one of the things I did was I worked at a private psychiatric hospital doing group psychotherapy with a group of schizophrenics. It was fascinating doing, you know, sort of like theater work and, and doing play work with these schizophrenics. And it was the most fascinating thing I'd ever done. So we flash forward. I've been doing it for about six months. I'm sitting at a restaurant on Sunset Boulevard with a producer who wants to write me and wants me to write a movie for him. And I keep looking at my watch because I got to get out of there. I don't want to be late for the psych hospital <laughs> where I'm working with schizophrenics. <laughs> so finally, I get out of there and I'm racing down La Cienica and I have a road to Damascus experience, except mine was on La Cienica. But <laughs> the reality was it hit me. I didn't want to be talking to producers about movies I was going to write. Yep. I wanted to do this for a living. I wanted to be a therapist. That's where your heart was. Clinician. And it exploded in my heart. And when I walked in the door of the, of the psychiatric hospital, I said to a friend of mine, I'm in. And I knew at that moment, I was going to work to get my clinical license retire from film and show but television, which I did, and become a full-time clinician, which I have been for 30 years in my private practice. I still write, as you know, I write articles and short stories and mystery novels. Um, but changing my life at that moment was the most significant change I ever made. And it's interesting because most of the time, when we do go through a big life change like that, what we're actually doing is returning to the self. Mm. Because when I was a kid, I wrote short stories. Mm -hmm. I was in college after I left engineering school, I wrote novels, none of them sold, but mm -hmm. I always loved writing prose. Mm -hmm. So finding myself writing film and television while I was very lucky in that field and worked very hard, 
my heart had always been in writing prose. Mm -hmm. So now as a therapist, I get to write about being a clinician. Uh, the lead character in my mystery novels, which all take place in Pittsburgh, yes. by the way, so <laughs> psychologists. And so the reader gets to know what it's like to be a clinician, what it's like to work with patients. Um, my guy, of course, gets caught up in murder mysteries and he's super brave and stuff, none of which I am. But he's my fantasy version of me. But the thing that I'm struck by at, at this advanced age that I am now is how much becoming a therapist allowed me to do the two things I needed to do most, live in a world of feeling and write about it. Wow. That is the thing that is so powerful for me. Wow. I get to live in a world of feeling and write about it. I'm so honored to share my patients' lives with them, mm -hmm. through their struggles with them, to weep when one of them has terminal cancer, mm -hmm. or to share with them their pain when their career dries up. I feel lucky to be part of that. And it, I think, helps open up my own heart, not only to compassion and the sense of connectedness we all have, but to my own source of intuition. Spoken like a man who's living his truth. That's for sure. Um, when, I'm, when I'm on my game, I <laughs> still lie to myself, fool myself, uh, fall into a kind of funny, snarky thing sometimes. You know, my old comedy oh. shot is still there. Yes. And so uh, I can be a real smart ass. <laughs> So uh, well, laughter uh, transmutes pain. So th there, there's yes, a place for good. that. <laughs> so then, then all my pains being transmuted. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but seriously, yeah. I, I no longer think whether it's through therapy or any work we do on ourselves, there's no perfectible version of ourselves in the future that's okay. We're okay now. Yep. We have to be okay now, including the things about ourselves we don't like we can keep working on. You know, I, when people say, what's the goal of therapy? Most people say, oh, to change or to be happy or to be transformed. I think the goal of therapy is to be okay with yourself. And when you're not okay with yourself, that's okay too. Right. That's it. Acceptance. Self-acceptance. And you can't, frankly, I don't think, access your intuition without self-acceptance. You can't. You 100% can't because intuition is really about authenticity. It's about being who you really are, right? And, yeah. and I love how your story really reflects that because you had the dream job. Like who wouldn't dream of sitting down with producers, writing movies, living the mm -hmm. Hollywood life, but a part of you recognized that that wasn't your path, that it didn't feel 100% authentic for you to continue on that path while it was yeah. good, it served its purpose and i'm sure mm -hmm. it provided you with opportunity to do the things that you love and that you are passionate about but if you had gone forward in that way that felt inauthentic then it wouldn't have been living your truth right you know yeah, that's exactly right that's you exactly know. right I, I benefited greatly from my experience uh in in show business um, uh, not only financially, but in terms of a lot of personal satisfaction, it is a brutal business. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think I was quite cut out for uh, the, the, I mean, I, God knows I have narcissistic traits, but I, 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 didn't, I didn't have that kind of bullet-like mentality where, you know, 24-7 you insist upon yourself to succeed. And I, I just didn't have it, especially after I came back from Nepal. I had a much more oceanic view of the human condition and our place in it. And so just being successful for its own sake began to feel tinny and, and um, unsatisfying to me. Mm -hmm. And so I'm able to be appreciative of my, my life in show business. And certainly my experience in show business allowed me to build my practice because I'm uniquely qualified yes. based on that experience to deal with the patients I deal with. Right. You know, if someone says to me, gee, I'm really anxious about pitching a story. Well, I've pitched a thousand times. So I know exactly what that anxiety right. is like. And so I think that helped. Absolutely. Building my practice. 
And so I always think one of the things that's important is that nothing that's come before should be looked at as a waste of time or something that was a big mistake because you can always learn from it. So even if you're following your intuition and it's taking you down a different road, there's no need to denigrate the road you've been on because well, you learn something from it. You, you just intuitively answered the next question I was going to ask you. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, what advice do you have? I mean, with all of this, um, with your experience working with so many people who are working with their own intuition, whether they're conscious of it or not, right? Because a lot of times we, we're using our intuition to figure all this stuff up and to get to know ourselves and to discover ourselves, though we're not consciously aware of it. I was going to ask you, like, what advice that you have for the people out there who are watching, who are, who are working with their creativity and their intuition. And, and I'd love for starters talking about, you know, what you just said about, you know, understanding that there, there are no real mistakes, right? There's just, there's just long ways and short ways and, and everything's a learning experience that ultimately can be used for our own good, right? Right. Well, Mark Twain said that good judgment comes from experience. Unfortunately, experience comes from bad judgment. <laughs> <laughs> and that's been true for me. I mean, if you can make 12 mistakes, I've made 13. <laughs> in fact, I always say to people, you know, I've been in and out of therapy as a patient for about 30 years. I'm as neurotic and insecure as I ever was. I just don't hassle myself about it anymore. Right. <laughs> I mean, while we were talking, a part of me was going, I hope I don't sound like a jerk. I hope I'm not being pedantic. You know, I look like an idiot. And then I go, yeah, but you always think stuff like that. That's okay. You know, so the, the most important thing I think a person can do is, number one, not denigrate what they've done before. If they've worked on a job that they didn't like, or they were in a marriage that was difficult and painful, or they you know, had an experience where, that they're ashamed of or angry about or whatever. That's for a creative person, for an intuitive person, that's all grist for the mill. Mm -hmm. That's data. It that's is data. That's data. great. Yes. That's all it is. It's just data. Yep. Okay. So then you want to say, what do I learn from it? And what do I think about what I've learned? And where does my intuition want me to go next? And that's the only way we can isolate patterns of negative behavior, but also realize there's something to be garnered from every experience we have, even if in retrospect, we wish we hadn't done it, you know? And the important thing then is self-acceptance. Because if you look at mistakes of the past or what you might think of as mistakes, as indicative of some character defect in you or you weren't meant to do X, Y, and Z, then you're really going to derail yourself. Because I don't know what anyone's meant to do. Mm -hmm. What's important is to follow where your instincts say you want to go. That's all you can do. Yep. And the totality of everything you've done is what fuels a lot of that intuition. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't spring whole, out of whole cloth. One of the reasons you may have really good emotional intelligence, let's say, good intuition about people, mm -hmm. is because of all the times you've had bad intuition about people <laughs> and you've learned. So true. You see what I mean? So if we don't denigrate everything we've been up until this moment, then this moment is full and rich because there is only this moment anyway. That's the ultimate truth. There's only this moment. There's no other moment. And so if this is the only moment that, that is real, follow your intuition at that moment about what the next moment should be. Exactly. 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 And that's what, that's really, you've hit the nail on the head with, you know, what this book is about and what we're talking about with radical intuition. It's getting to that that place of presence, that stillness, that moment where it speaks. And that's where your mm -hmm. intuition comes from. It comes from that quiet stillness within you that you get to when you live in the moment and you see who you are in the moment and stop worrying about tomorrow and worrying about all the things that happened in the past and getting out of all the focus on the outside world and just mm -hmm. being still. 
I, well, one time somebody, because I had been doing some spiritual practices since Nepal, and someone said, well, what book should I read or what should I study to start my spiritual practice? And I said, actually, to start your spiritual practice, I'd recommend two hours of silence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most people can't do that. <laughs> and I was going to say, that's hard for a lot of people. Yeah. You know, where you actually just sit with all of your feelings. And like in meditation, see your thoughts and feelings like clouds. Just let them go by. Don't attach to them. You know, Ram Dass said that when we, we try to sit with ourselves, each thought or feeling comes along and says, think me, think me, mm -hmm. attach to me. And the goal is to not do that, but just watch them go by. Right. Even if you have the thought, gee, am I meditating correctly? That's another thought you just right. let go by. And after a while, it liberates you. And you realize I'm not the totality of my thoughts and my worries and my past experiences. I'm this breathing entity in this moment that is open to anything that's going to occur to me. Brilliant. Brilliant. I think that's a perfect place for us to settle on. Dennis, this has been a fantastic conversation. I, oh. I want to talk more about this with you. This has been wonderful. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Um, and, you know, whoever is, is watching, you know, you have to pay attention and, and allow yourself to be everything you are. That's why I shared that there were parts of me during this conversation where I was nervous, where I was wondering, what if I give a stupid answer to Kim's <laughs> question? Gee, do I sound like a know-it-all? I just folded all of that in. Yep. And that's okay, too. Yep. And just be ourselves and accept ourselves. We all self-censor. You know, we're out here, we're like, am I doing this? How do I peer to the outside world, right? So it gets back right. to that authenticity and acceptance and just living true to ourselves and accepting those selves. And, and that's really the secret. That's the secret to yeah. living the best life. So yeah. and um, when in doubt, just take a nice deep inhalation and then a nice deep exhalation. And that's the reality of your life. That moment, everything else is chattering monkey mind. <laughs> Indeed. But that inhalation and exhalation, is the only actual moment of your actual life. The present moment. So I'll do that for a second. I think we're all living in the present moment right now. <laughs> well, thank you, Dennis. We really appreciate oh. sharing your wisdom with us and for all the creativity and intuition that you bring into the world. Um, everybody, thanks for staying with us to the end. This has been such a fantastic conversation. Uh, you can check out Dennis's books if you want to read a little bit about his, uh, his imagination on his website, uh, DennisPalumbo.com, or on Amazon or bookstores all around the world. Right? That's right. All right. Thanks, everybody. And thanks, Dennis. Thank you for having me. It was my pleasure. Mm -hmm.